Mm-hmm. Welcome back to ThinkTech Hawaii, Humane Architecture, here in downtown Honolulu on a Tuesday afternoon, 5 o'clock. So welcome back. In this show, we're going to address issues around architecture on our islands of uh, Hawaii and way beyond, actually particularly in the, in the tropics. And uh, who was actually supposed to be my first guest um, was kind enough to let Mr. Les Wallach go first because he happened to be on the island last week. But uh, David Rockwood uh, is our first, our actual first guest because I could have think of no one else to be perfect to introduce what we're talking about. So welcome, David. <coughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank thanks. you for having me. Yeah. Thanks for being here. And so actually the, the title of the show today is called Tropic Curing and we had quite some interesting discussions over the summer with Jay and Zuri about many possible names for the show and this is actually one that was also part of the list and now it became Humane Architecture which mm -hmm. is exciting too. But Tropic Curing was sort of uh, a major uh, sort of suggestion to 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 call the show right. for a certain reason. So why don't we just dive in and you talk <coughs> a little bit about yourself, where you come from, literally and figuratively speaking, mm -hmm. relative to tropic hearing. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Martin. <coughs> uh, always difficult to know where to start, but uh, the uh, <coughs> when I think about the tropics, I think my first um, exposure was I was going to school on the East Coast uh, <clears throat> in New Jersey. And uh, my family had a reunion in Mexico. <clears throat> uh, and uh, so that was the first time that I had the, uh, walked into the hotel, meet uh, my extended family, and the lobby was completely open. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, there was no glass, there was no entry doors. Uh, so similar to what we all know from some of the original hotels here in Hawaii. <clears throat> And uh, it was on the ocean, just like we have here in Waikiki, and, and the, the, the sea breeze is blowing through. Uh, and I was so struck, because I'd just come from New Jersey, uh, everything was sealed up, and there was snow drifted on the <clears throat> outside the doors. Uh, and that the sense of kind of uh, enclosure and isolation was, it was completely reversed. And that sense of openness to other people in the environment was, was just dramatic for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so at that point, you know, I, I really started to think, you know, at some point in my life, I want to live in the tropics. And, uh, and, and so I sort of directed <coughs> things, and uh, fortunately, I was uh, happy that that worked out. So, but maybe, uh, maybe Martin, you can uh, talk about kind of your experience, because I know that you've had a similar, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> of coming from a very, very different climate, mm -hmm. and, and what, that, what that sort of really means. That's true. Yeah. So we both come from the, this is sort of the, the statistics, we come from 60% of the world climates which are basically tempered, mm -hmm. which you got these swings of cold and hot. And then for these 60%, the minority of 40% of the tropics is obviously a paradisic sort of illusion maybe that we both Mm -hmm. became uh, basically lured into. <laughs> <laughs> right. And myself, similar to you, I grew up in a temperate, moderately temperate German climate, then checked out the U.S., the way more extreme Midwestern mm -hmm. climate uh, with a 12-minute walk to school in Nebraska, having to wear a full facial mask not to get a frostbite. Right. Went to the other extreme in Tucson, Arizona, where 120 degree and people say oh it's no problem it's dry heat but 120 degrees is 120 degrees so finally worked my way west obviously as you right so here we are right you've been here 12 years about I think it's your 13th year mm -hmm. I've been uh, four years here so right so here we are uh, we we have a job as well here which is we teach architecture at the school of architecture here at, at up at mm -hmm. UH but we're, I like to call us practicators because we're first and foremost coming from practice. So maybe you want to talk yeah. a little bit about your, your practice background. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Um, <coughs> well, I, I actually started uh, in Portland where I grew up, <coughs> uh, and I uh, first opened an office there. Uh, and then I lived in New York City for uh, 10 years and was teaching and then doing uh, some practice uh, as well. I was an adjunct uh, professor at Pratt Institute. Uh, <coughs> and uh, 
So again, sort of uh, in terms of architecture and thinking about the, the, the tropics, uh, in those instances, uh, I didn't really have the opportunity to, to work on uh, buildings for the tropics. So again, it was a, a, a real revelation for me to begin to think about uh, how you design for the tropics. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, as you know, uh, when you're designing in temperate climates, uh, it's you know there is the there's the summer where it does get hot, but uh, for a lot of the year, you do need to really close up the building. And so the idea of energy conservation and the kinds of kinds of things that you need to do in terms of insulated glass and insulation and, and thermal breaks and all those sorts of things uh, <clears throat> was was completely changed for me. Um, and then I, I think really thinking about uh, uh, this whole sense, you know, that I kind of first described, this uh, feeling of, of the breeze kind of flowing through an interior space, which was also very much almost an outdoor space, uh, <clears throat> was so powerful that I felt to be in the tropics, one really needs to always feel that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, otherwise, why why kind of be here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so there's this wonderful uh, uh, sensibility that that really comes through that. So how how to design uh, buildings that allow that to happen? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> there's a lot of things that do become difficult uh, in, to do that and to do it well, so that it truly works. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I think you know we're both admirers of uh, some of the the architecture that happened here, you know, in Hawaii, uh, <clears throat> sort of mid-century and uh, a little bit later, uh, prior to air conditioning coming on board. And, <clears throat> and a lot of the architects, uh, when you really look at the buildings, understood how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that they work quite well. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, those are just some of the things. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know if you and, want to... And I remember we share a lot of things, and one is these early memories of coming here. We were both interviewed, and they put you up in the Queen Copigliani mm -hmm. uh, building hotel. Right. And they put me up in the Ala Moana building. Mm -hmm. And so I remember, you know, us sharing sort of this moment of coming from, you know, the temperate climate and then getting off the plane immediately the sort of multi-sensatory kind of lure of the tropic, the, the smell of the flowers, the sort of sweetness mm -hmm. of, of the air and the, the gentle breezes blowing. And then having going through Nimitz, which was a little sort of disturbing, what kind of is that? You mm -hmm. know, but finally arriving in the hotel, and then um, all of a sudden you come into a hotel where everything is closed up and then there is this sort of thermostat that basically says like, 68 or 72 doesn't mm -hmm. matter right and all of a sudden i was thinking wait a minute that is like how it felt outside so mm -hmm. i basically opened that sliding door luckily this is a mid-century these are both mid-century buildings so i can still do that right and all of a sudden there it was turning off the ac which also has an environmental sort of advantage just on the side right but for us way more importantly maybe in tropic hearing in general is sort of the feel, right? And that sold me on coming here and basically, if I can sleep year round with the door open, right? And uh, that's it, right. right? And ever since we do it that way, you know, right. you're in your building, we choose a building that is conducive of these sort of systems, right? And we pretty much do it. And then this sounds like too good to be true, right? Because why isn't anyone and everyone thinking like we do. If you look around, mm -hmm. the more recent developments, the very current ones all have fixed glazing, they're all hermetic, they're all air conditioned. Right. So where did this go? We ask ourselves on a daily basis. And um, mm -hmm. I just want to let the audience know that what you see in the background here is, is one of David's sort of uh, applications of the philosophy of tropic hearing that you're going to talk about uh, mm -hmm. along the, the show a little bit, but unless you want to, you're not going to dive into specific details. It's just basically to illustrate sort mm -hmm. of visually the, the philosophy. But, mm -hmm. but Zura being our great orchestrator, I, I love the synchronization when you were talking very empathically mm -hmm. about the breeze and she was showing the diagrams of, mm -hmm. the, of, the, of the breeze and the wind flow. Oh, so right. maybe you can talk about that. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting, you know, the, the transition that, that you described. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of, lot of reasons probably why that happened. You know, the, 
the, the equipment was there and it was available. Uh, it, you know, it did, it did allow people to really give a high degree of control over their kind of, you know, their, th their, uh, their comfort, you know, mm -hmm. their thermal comfort. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and, and if a building isn't designed the right way, it does become uncomfortable. Uh, so it actually gave architects a lot of flexibility in terms of how they design things. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as we know, buildings are very expensive and um, uh, real estate is expensive, housing is expensive. Uh, and so to try to be as efficient as you can with the overall layout, right, of a building is, is very important, as you know. So, uh, you know, the, the, the typical high-rise building has a double-loaded corridor, uh, so you can enter the apartments on either side. And um, as we know, that's the most efficient way to do it because you share the circulation with uh, two rather than just one. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that's become the norm. But the problem is, you know, I don't need to tell you, I'm sort of talking to the, to the audience out there, uh, <coughs> is, it's, is it's very difficult to get cross ventilation. Uh, and if you don't have the cross ventilation, then you probably, to be comfortable in most uh, orientations in the tropics, you need air conditioning. Mm -hmm. uh, so something so simple as that. Uh, uh, so, you know, as we know, there's many buildings here, again, kind of around that kind of era that we were just discussing mid-century and a little later, uh, that have what we call the single-loaded corridor, so that they have exposures on the two sides. Mm -hmm. um, so I think maybe just to, you know, trans transition into this project, um, I, was, I was fortunate to get a uh, Fulbright uh, specialist grant uh, in, it was actually in urban planning in uh, Da Nang, Vietnam. Uh, so I was working with uh, some lecturers, and uh, I think we had about 27 students uh, <coughs> that were uh, that joined us on the project, and uh, it was a very short six-week period. Uh, <coughs> but it was really brought to actually my attention by the uh, lecturers there uh, at the University in Da Nang uh, about the kind of uh <coughs> rural to urban uh, migration issue that they're uh, facing there. Uh, and so we wanted to see if we could do something about that to provide, um, you know, more humane, uh, higher quality, uh, comfortable uh, uh, places for uh, these people uh, that were that were moving into the city. And <clears throat> it's a real challenge. Uh, and again, part of the the, the issue is this uh, thermal comfort of and and the connection to the environment. Uh, da Nang is very much like. Honolulu. It has a, a beautiful uh, shore, uh, and this uh, this project is actually located near the industrial zone, uh, but also just a few blocks from the ocean. Uh, so, so it's an interesting kind of uh, juxtaposition of uh, of having the, uh, and I think we were talking about that the other day, the, the kind of pretty and the and the gritty, right, mm -hmm. on on either side. Mm -hmm. um, I think yep. that's an excellent point to make a short little break and to dive back into that after yep. the break. So see so you back on Humane Architecture and David Rockwood about tropic hearing soon. Aloha, Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3 in the afternoon. Do not tune in in the morning. My topic is energy efficiency. It sounds dry as heck, but it's not. We're paying five billion dollars a year for imported oil. My job is to shave that, shave that, shave that down in homes and buildings while delivering better comfort, better light, better air conditioning, better everything. So if you're interested in your future, you'd better tune in to me. Three o'clock every other Monday, code green, aloha, and thank you very much. Welcome back to Humane Architecture. Today with David Walkwood talking about tropic hearing, and we just stopped before the break about some very catchy terms, the contradiction of the the gritty and, and the pretty. And maybe I want to say at this point that because the show started to be shorter and we only have 15 minutes left and we not only could we talk forever because we love what, what we're talking about, but also this project is sort of so, so, so dense. So I want to say already now that whatever 
one sees, people might say, well, this is in Vietnam, and, but we're in Hawaii, so what does it have to do with us? So we probably uh, should, should mention at some point, and I do it now, that actually there's many similarities in, in culture and climate, so that I believe, strongly believe that this project here has a super big potential to become uh, uh, what they like to call workforce buildings here, which I try to avoid that term because I think it's highly sort of um, problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, you like to call it worker housing, and we both mm -hmm. also started to call it proletarian. Mm -hmm. So there's also a, an aspect of that, that uh, certain sort of parts of the population are increasingly being cut out. And especially in the tropic, that seems to lure, continue to lure a lot of people. There seems to be this this mm -hmm. sort of stress. Right, right. Well, <clears throat> yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks for that. It it is something where um, you know this this is in Vietnam. It's a specific site, uh, and it's um, <clears throat> uh, and and it's a particular kind of profile right, of of people, but. Uh, by the same token, there's many similarities. I think that you pointed out. Um, uh, there, there, you know, there are many people that obviously, you know, it's in the news and the front page every day here, right? That uh, that can't afford uh, housing in Hawaii. <coughs> uh, so there's there's a similarity here in in Vietnam. Um, the climate is very similar as well. It gets a little bit hotter there, uh, uh, and it gets a little bit colder, but but not all that drastically different. Uh, and there's uh, there's a kind of uh, profile of people I think or families that uh, that are similar. So a lot of people are coming in as singles, but then they may uh, start a family, or their families from the countryside may join them. And so there's a there's a, a kind of di di dynamic uh, group of uh, you know demographic, if you will, uh, <coughs> uh, of, of people. And I think that there's some similarities there. So then, then the question is like, how, how can you provide that, and how can you make it affordable, and have it really work, uh, and and not just work in a purely functional sense, but you know, I, I think we don't want to forget that, you know, everyone should be able to enjoy uh, this kind of idea of what we're calling tropic hearing, or the or really the uh, the pleasure of of being in this very kind of privileged uh, climate, which is which is uh, arguably maybe one of the most pleasant right on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how can we, how can we really um, kind of solve that? And a lot of it is architecture. Uh, it's certainly not the whole story. Uh, as we know, there's a lot of things having to do with financing and policy and public-private partnerships and all those good mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. uh, but an architect certainly um, uh, can play a role, I think, in, in, in basically how to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And so. I, I, I know that, that you and uh, you know many of the people at the, at the university at the School of Architecture uh, are really kind of working on this problem and, and hopefully we can make some uh, mm -hmm. impact. Mm -hmm. So let's introduce maybe some more terms that go through our mind all the time. So one is actually relates to the plant life as well, which learned a while ago, we all know what invasive is. Mm -hmm. and we know this from the plant life, the stuff that comes, takes over, suppresses the local. And we allow ourselves to apply that to architecture as well. Mm -hmm. So architecture mm -hmm. that is not uh, tolerant of the local relevances, and mm -hmm. they might be climatically, they might be socially, we allow ourselves to call that. Mm -hmm. And then there is exotic. Mm -hmm. And there's also, I think, cross-disciplinary uh, we do some research in other areas, like music, for example, and it traces back to your early, you know, start at Queen Kapolyani. So mm -hmm. maybe you want to talk about exotic or exotic car a little bit, if uh -huh. you don't mind. Oh, okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I think that there's, um, you know, and it's, it's it's interesting when you look back, and we were kind of talking about that mid-century, and and of course that's when, uh, you know, Hawaii tourism really sort of began, and. Uh, when you look at the advertisements, you know it, it very much, I think, is uh, really trying to capture that kind of spirit of, uh, you know, as you were talking about it, multi-sensory, even though it's just a, maybe a magazine ad, mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. or maybe a poster mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. Pan Am Airlines or mm -hmm. something of that sort. Uh, so, you know, they're trying to bring out where you really smell the flowers, where you hear the sound of the, of the ocean breeze. Uh, the ukulele and the you know the sway of the of the dancers and all of that right, which really comes together, 
to uh, create this kind of sense of of the exotic. <coughs> um, I think the um, the, di the the difficulty is you know now is that uh, <coughs> you know we we need to uh, to somehow um, you know continue this this kind of uh, uh, feeling and appreciation of those kind of true things, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that we're, we've also kind of in our contemporary culture, we're so used to images and sound bites, and there's the, however many I don't use Twitter, but there's so, you know so many characters you can use, right? So everything is mm -hmm. very fast, fast paced, and we need to consume things. Uh, <clears throat> and I think a lot of the tropics is is really about the kind of slowness, right? It's to kind of slow down and to really sort of experience things. Mm -hmm. um, and I, again, I think some of those early images were, were about that. You know, they were kind of out on the lounge chair, and you imagine they were there, all, or the hammock, and they mm -hmm. were there all day, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was part of that whole kind of mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if we've lost that kind of in mm -hmm. the kind of, you know, the, the pace of contemporary mm -hmm. life somehow, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how that really kind of matches up with, uh, you know, this, this really kind of feeling of, in mm -hmm. the tropics. Mm -hmm. I don't know. No, and it's, I think it's, it's life and it's behavior. So here in the show, I always hear sometimes I look a little bit too toasted or roasted when I come here because I just try to, you know, whenever live that, and you do too, so I know you basically walk mainly. And if you don't walk, you, you bicycle. Mm -hmm. And then you're exposed to the elements. You, know, you wish there would be more shade, but if not, you know, you try to minimize your mm -hmm. exposure to the sun, but you also allow the sun to come. So you're not driving in an air-conditioned car to an air-conditioned school, which you unfortunately have. Uh, but you, you try to live that. And we actually came here. Whenever we drive, we're not, like, you know, perfect. We drive open with a top-down and drive a convertible, which we believe that's the way to go on an island mm -hmm. where it's always sunny. So why not doing that? And the studio doesn't have a makeup room, so there's no like making you know us look pretty. So we are basically mm -hmm. how we are. And so it gets us to sweating, right? Sweating is sort of an essential thing that a human body is using to regulate mm -hmm. uh, sort of its functioning in the tropics. And I'm sort of, hopefully, audience doesn't feel it too much, but actually you have a pretty bad cold from having to have been in all these AC places. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really about the sort of experience. So when, when you sweat, you know, it's, it's part of what your body does to cool you down, but it's also part of the experience. And here in our relatively mild tropics, we basically have the ability to moderate that mm -hmm. in a really sort of a playful, enjoyable kind of way. However, the environments have to be supportive of that, and that's the sort of what we're criticizing. So maybe another word yes. pair would be mm -hmm. like, surfacial surface and substantial, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say to use this mm -hmm. sort of pair of words and right. what comes to your mind when we <laughs> use these? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, well I, think that's, I think that's true. I think the, um, <coughs> you know, I think uh, another thing and maybe kind of get back to this, uh, I think how we've become so, uh, um, you know, the Fascinated, I think, by mm -hmm. by images, mm -hmm. uh, obsessed, even, uh, obsessed, yeah. even right, uh, and I think it kind of makes sense because we have we kind of have the ability to really consume a lot of a lot of images, mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> and so and and they're compelling and they and it's even become sort of addictive, um, and I think as a, as a result of that, a lot of things you know start to then use kind of uh, symbols, right, as a as a way of communicating things, you know, mm -hmm. uh, certainly the corporate logo or uh, or other kinds of symbols right which can we can identify very quickly mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we've become so kind of used to that as a s kind of surrogate right for something else and that something else is the actual experience of something mm -hmm. the actual life experience of something mm -hmm. um, and I think you know obviously we see that people you know are worried about obesity of kids and that's because they're not running around in the backyard playing anymore they're sitting playing the video game, right? Uh, and the video game is more compelling now than, than actually going out and playing a, a game with their friends. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I think these are all, all kind of challenges. And I think, you know, in terms of architecture, uh, some of this sort of, sort of applies where certain kind of symbols become applied to a surface uh, instead of designing the building in such a way that it actually provides the experience of what mm -hmm. that place 
really is, mm -hmm. right? We use this term genus loci, right? Mm -hmm. Which is mm -hmm. kind of the spirit of the place. Um, and <clears throat> I think we have to really kind of uh, now push for that. And, and, and in a way, I think it's a struggle because there are, there are a lot of forces, kind of financially, uh, kind of uh, what we're used to. We mm -hmm. have certain mm -hmm. habits. This is the way we make buildings, right? Uh, to, to, to go back, right? I don't know. Do you have yeah, any thoughts yeah. on that? Martin, I'm sure you do. Uh, I know you do. <laughs> I, I do, and I, unfortunately, I just got the notification. We're like two minutes uh, uh -huh. to close the show. So yes. um, I, thank you, Zuri, for always selecting. We'll leave it up to Zuri to select uh, the, the graphics in mm -hmm. the back. And the picture she showed, you know, I think uh, symbolizes what you're talking mm -hmm. about, where usually you have renderings. They're pretty to sell something, sell an illusion. Mm -hmm. And it's mostly flowers and people. And you can make, like I use the example, and Jay asked me to run a show about the new and the old international marketplace, and I'm about to have DeSoto Brown, who's a curator at the Bishop Museum, talk about that. Mm -hmm. So look forward mm -hmm. to that show. Oh, great. And you know, you can render the new international marketplace really pretty, you mm -hmm. know, and it looks like it has all the senses, but in reality, it's air conditioned corporate stores, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in your case, also in this image here, uh, basically, you know what you what you basically render what you suggest is suggestive of actually be representative of the real stuff so a swing for example really means you know i'm outdoors my kid is swinging there i'm going there so mm -hmm. so that's sort of the it's you have a sort of substantial approach and once again we would we would argue that this architecture here is very buildable here maybe differently in vietnam where labor is cheap and material is cheap here it's expensive but mm -hmm. we actually ran a couple of shows with mr the mr is prefab on the island mm -hmm. less than mm -hmm. adam camper so this yes. would be a perfect project for them and we actually have some in the pipeline mm -hmm. together with them right, right. so um i think concluding that um I will share the secret that I'm that I'm hoping to have many more shows uh, with you, but also hopefully you being on this seat here at times, oh. because I see tropic curing and I think we see it as sort of a philosophy that is inclusive, so net exclusive. So it's not owned by us. Yes. We just believe that's the way to go, and we reach out to other people. So we Great. welcome new collaborators and. Mm -hmm. um, Great. I want to thank you, David, for yeah. this excellent introduction to well, that philosophy. Well, thank you, for, thank you very much for having me and everyone on Think Tech. And uh, yeah, this is great. All so right. I really appreciate it. Yeah, opportunity. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. And I hope you guys liked it. So you will tune in again uh, next Tuesday, five o'clock, downtown Honolulu. Could be nice to sort of basically wrap up your your work day and wrap your mind around some uh, more interesting and uh, some more sort of um, dreaming ways because tropic hearing after all is about dreaming. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah.